Hello and welcome to Unpublished TV. I'm Ed Hand. UTV is the newest production from Unpublished Media. This weekly live panel discussion completes our set of four internet properties created to help you influence and impact public policy decision making in Canada. They're the unpublished.com, the unpublished cafe podcast, which I also host, and unpublished.vote, an issue based information and voting platform. Each week, we'll introduce a new topic through Unpublished Cafe Podcast and Unpublished.vote, where you'll find the podcast and background information from a variety of sources to help further inform before you cast your vote and email your MP to tell them why you think what you do. Then every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll reconvene here on UTV to examine how the issues evolved and how you, our audience, reacted to our poll question. We want your input as well. You can send us comments or questions through Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, and we'll post them to our panel. This week, we're going to focus on one of the most polarizing issues of this pandemic, mandatory masks. Many cities in Ontario have brought in legislation to make them mandatory in their jurisdiction. Ontario Premier Doug Ford supports that, but won't call for a provincial-wide order because it would be unenforceable. In Quebec, masks will be mandatory on public transit and indoor places. Now, it's easy to see how some people were against it because of the messaging. It's been mixed. Back in January, the Public Health Agency of Canada was against wearing masks because of a false sense of security. Since then, it's backtracked and said masks do reduce the spread of infection. On our unpublished.vote question, should wearing face masks be mandatory in public places? 36.6% said yes, 606 said no, 2.8% were unsure. Now remember, this is not scientific, just reflects your views. And joining us this evening on Unpublished TV to talk about mandatory masks, David Coletto, president of Abacus Data. Christine Van Gyne is the litigation director with the Canadian Constitution Foundation, and Marvin Ryder, assistant professor at the DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. And thank you all for uh, joining us. And of course, uh, we'd also take any email or, or any questions from Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube for our panel or myself. So more, our viewers are more than welcome to pass them along. Now, first off, let's uh, just run this by the whole panel. Uh, do you wear a mask in public when you go indoors? Marvin? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, I think the key word was what you said was indoors. I don't wear a mask in the car when I'm driving mm -hmm. around. I, I don't merit wear a mask when I'm walking the dog down a street. But if I'm going to be indoors and I know I'm going to have a hard time social distancing, uh, it's just not a big deal to slip the mask on and then slip it off five minutes later when I'm done shopping. How about you, Christine? Yeah, I wear a mask when I'm out in public and can't social distance for myself and for others. Right. Okay. And you, David? I do uh, here in Ottawa where I am, it's mm. been uh, mandatory for, for over almost a week now. So uh, I've been doing that and I was doing it more and more I found in the lead up to that uh, mandatory um, requirement. Marvin, why do you think this mandatory mask issue is so polarizing? <laughs> well, first it, we start with the United States. The United States is a country who treasures its freedoms and we have the right to bear arms and we have the right to and we have the right to not wear masks. And so you've seen uh, on YouTube and other places like this, some tremendous video of people trying to assert this right. I can go out and infect anybody I want at any time and I don't have any consequences. In Canada, by nature, we're a little more compliant. You know, we're the type of people who apologize when we do something right and not when we do something wrong. And I think it's part of our system to always think about the other person. Uh, the polarizing aspect, though, is this word mandatory. And, and I know there are citizens out there that when they put a mask on, they feel like they're gagging. Some people, unfortunately, suffer from asthma or other breathing conditions. And they, they feel, especially on these hot, hot days we're getting in July and August, that they, they almost feel trapped by it. Um, and and they, they understand they should do it for the other person. But sacrificing me for them is a difficult choice for some people. How about you, Christine? Why do you think it's polarizing so much? And of course, you're the lawyer here. Um, well, first, I, I just to respond to what, what Professor Ryder just said, for, for people who can't wear a mask for medical reasons, it's not about sacrificing themselves for others. Uh, they actually can't wear a mask because it's too much of, breathing, of a breathing impediment for them to properly function. Or if you have some type of trauma-based PTSD related to a breathing obstruction, um, it's not about putting yourself before others um, in refusing to wear a mask. You really do have an impediment. Um, 
but to your question about why I think people are angry, I think that there's a couple of reasons. The first is what you mentioned in your introduction, that there was a lot of conflicting information about masks at the beginning, and we were told so many different things about masks. A lot of things that people sort of intuitively knew were wrong at the beginning, that we were told um, that we shouldn't wear a mask. And a, a lot of people really challenged that idea, and it undermined a lot of credibility that the government had um, on that issue for them to then turn around and say masks are mandatory when, you know, only a few months ago they were saying, do not wear a mask, you know, sort of tweeting in all caps, don't wear a mask. The other issue is that the mandatory mask order has been imposed in a number of communities where the rate of infection doesn't necessarily justify an order like that. So one of the first communities to impose it was Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph, which is uh, it includes a lot of small and rural communities where the rate of infection is quite low. And to tell people in those communities, you need to wear a mask. And by the way, um, the, the medical exemptions are, are not able to be claimed at face value, which is what we were told by a lot of residents there. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you get a lot of resistance from people. David, uh, it is polarizing, and you you went to to people uh, talking about this uh, with Abacus data. But first, did, why did you think it was so? Or you feel it's so polarizing. Mandatory is a good uh, way to put it, there, uh, Marvin. Yeah, well, I think anytime government forces us to do something that we may not necessarily think we, should, we have to do or need to do, it's going to create some tension and polarization in in the debate. Um, we find that on a on a range of issues, you know. Um, over the number of years, if, if government steps in and forces us to do something, there's always going to be, as, as Professor Ryder said, those in all countries that, that just don't like that and mm -hmm. are opposed to that kind of um, that kind of action. But you know, I'm not sure I would describe the debate around this as polarizing. Um, there's far more issues that I've pulled on over the last 12 years that find greater opposition than mandatory mask wearing. Like we did a survey at the end of June that showed. Only 15% of Canadians outright opposed uh, governments making mask wearing mandatory. Everybody else, for the most part, either said they supported it or they could go along with it. And, um, and so that, to me, is a signal that's not as polarizing, perhaps, as we might think. There's a sizable group who are uh, upset about it. And even if they are a small minority, they will vocalize that. And it will appear to be far more opposition, maybe, than actually exists. But... You know, about one out of four Canadians right now, or at the end of June anyway, said that they never wear a mask uh, when they go into a public place like a store. Um, about half of Canadians say they're wearing it all the time or almost always. Um, and when you look at what divides ca Canadians, it's really interesting. It's not like what we're seeing in the United States where some of the opposition is politically driven, is ideological. So there's some of that in Canada. Conservatives a little more likely to say, I'm not wearing a mask. Mm. But I actually think it's not so much ideology driving that. It's, as Christine uh, alluded to, it's where they live. So those living in more rural, small town communities across the country, there you see mask wearing less frequent and therefore opposition um, and, and therefore less support for making them mandatory in those kinds of communities. Because for people there, they're like, I don't think I need to wear them. What's the, why are you mm -hmm. forcing me to do something that um, I don't think is necessarily needed to prevent um, the spread of the virus. All right. Now, uh, in, in the, the results of your your polling that I was uh, reading, the, the thing I found surprising was the most resistance came in that 45 to 59 year age. You know, uh, young people, millennials, they get it. Of course, older folks who were uh, a little concerned or more concerned because of the targeting, um, they're, on, they're wearing the mask. But that's, I'm a little surprised by that. Are you? I... <laughs> It's one of those results that that yeah has me scratching my head a little bit. I think, but then on the other hand, when I when I've looked at and tracked the, the pandemic as a whole over the last number of months, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the consistent groups that seems to go against the grain is that middle aged category, where you know people often say young people don't care about you know the pandemic, they're not distancing, and we can always point to those stories or pictures of that happening. And in the United States, I think. There, there does appear to be a lot of evidence that young people are um, helping to spread the virus. But up here in Canada, you know, just anecdotally, I was in the eastern townships this past weekend where, strikingly, um, the culture of masks there is night and day to what it is in Ottawa, where I live. 
I went into a mall, which I haven't been into in a number of months. And I would say maybe 20% of people were, wear were wearing a mask. Restaurants have been open there for a number of times. But when we looked, when I digged into the data and came home and I said, okay, I'm gonna look at this. Um, and we look at Quebec, the views of those living in Montreal and Quebec City are night and day different than those in other parts of Quebec. Um, those in Montreal where, where the number of cases have been much mm -hmm. higher, much more likely uh, to say they wear a mask. So when we look at it from the age perspective, I think, I think um, it's one of those groups where there's still most middle-aged Canadians say they're wearing masks. They support mandatory uh, mask wearing, but they're just you know, less likely to do it than other, other age groups. Right. Okay. Now, now Christine, um, the CCF has come out uh, against this, obviously. Uh, they had issues. Uh, it was what uh, the loss of liberty, I think, was the, was the, the line in your, in your release, was it not? Yeah, so first, our, our issues are with it being imposed in communities where it's not warranted on the basis of the rate of infection. So communities where it's being imposed, but the rate of infection is quite low, so rural communities. Um, our other concern is on the um, imposition of the mask without medical exemption. So we sent an open letter to municipalities in Ontario and asked them to ensure that their mask order, if they're having a, a, an order or their mask bylaw, if they're having a bylaw, include an exemption for people who can't wear a mask for medical reasons. And that we ask that that exemption apply at face value. So a person asserts their right to a medical exemption and they cannot be interrogated or questioned or have a uh, physician's note required um, by, by you know, shop, shopkeepers, gas station attendants because that was the experience of a number of people who had reached out to our organization. They were saying, we can't get into the grocery store to buy toilet paper. I can't wear a mask because of, you know, a, medical, a, real, a real medical condition. The people who wrote to me explained it, what their medical conditions are. And especially if it's a trauma-based phobia that you have, you probably don't want to get into detail about what went on in your life that has resulted in you being afraid of having a breathing obstruction. And you're even less likely to want to get into that in a small community where you are more likely to know the people who you're interacting with in these shops. So we asked for these exemptions to apply at face value. And uh, the city of Toronto actually did that. In their bylaw, it explicitly says that, um, and, and in the guidance to their bylaw, it says, uh, stores are not permitted, they use the term permitted to ask for proof of a medical exemption. And on the signs that the stores have put up that are designed by the city, it says um, that, that stores are not required to ask for proof of an exemption. So we're really pleased with that result from our advocacy in terms of um, it's still applying in communities where we think it's unwarranted. Uh, we still have some work to do on that, but um, in reality, I think that the courts are going to stay, are, are not going to be able to deal with this in a timely fashion if we were to challenge it. So the mass orders are, are almost certainly likely to stay. You know, Marvin, I, I wonder from the business perspective here, if I'm a business owner and I, I own it, I, I don't want the government telling me that somebody else can come into my store without a mask. Do, do they have any recourse here? Well, this is, of course, a, a rock and a hard place scenario here. Mm -hmm. a, a city passes a bylaw with the best of intentions, but they don't really have the ability to police or enforce it. So they then turn to the shopkeeper or the store owner or the sporting team or whoever it happens to be and says, now you've got to make this so, number one, and it becomes very difficult to do. And I think if I'm the owner, then I have to make some judgments here. I, a moment ago, to talk about uh, not requiring someone to explain why you have to have a mask. It's a bit to me like a, a parking for the handicap. Uh, I have seen people park in a handicapped space who don't appear to be handicapped, but they've got a nice blue sticker and that just, mm -hmm. okay, even though they don't look handicapped, fine, go ahead and park there. But I've also seen people pull into handicapped spaces without a blue sticker mm -hmm. who just can't be bothered doing this. And that's a little bit of the worry here. If we're going to make the shopkeeper enforce these rules, if they just let anybody say, well, I'm sorry, I can't wear a mask, then what's the point of the rule in the first place? Well, I, I, and I, you can actually, on the internet now, they have these fake uh, cards for getting you up, like saying, I, don't, I can't, you know, I can't wear a mask. And 
So it's obviously out there already. I think they sold like 2,000 in 30 minutes. So, it, you know, obviously it, it's in the States too. So what do you expect? <laughs> I, I would say we should be careful about making claims that people who assert that they have a disability don't actually have them. A lot of people who have a disability, uh, it, it's it's invisible and they, you can't necessarily mm -hmm. see that there's something um, interfering with their ability to breathe or interfering with their ability to wear a mask. So we would, we, and, and I think that the, I would, I would say most people are not going to walk around saying I have a disability. So I keep, when they really don't, um, wait a minute, wait, wait a very minute. Small have, you these videos? <laughs> have you been watching these videos of, of people out there asserting all kinds of things? Now, most of those come out of the United States, but there's all kinds of people who are saying, Oh no, I don't have to do this. Oh no, I got, and they start, just, they'll make any justification they can. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I understand what you're saying. A person with a, a valid claim, absolutely. But how would I know if I'm a shopkeeper that you have a valid claim? If you presented yourself to me and said, excuse me, Mr. Ryder, I can't wear a mask. I, I have something. I'd look at you and I think, well, you don't, don't appear to have a valid reason for this. Some sort of ID would help shopkeepers tremendously. You know, it's it's an infringement on people's right to their medical privacy to have a shopkeeper demand disclosure of their medical condition. And I don't think we're at this stage where um, we would should get into issuing permits to have an exemption from the mask. This, the, I, I, in reality, I don't think that these masks are going to be a part of our lives for for that much longer. That we need to create a bureaucracy that deals with um, issuing these permits. But I would agree with you that stores are certainly in a difficult position because if they fail to enforce this order or bylaw, the penalty in most communities is, uh, is about $5,000. And I'll remind you that the penalty for opening your business at the peak of the pandemic was about $750 in most places. So why is it that the penalty is so large when the rate of infection is so much lower um, for what I would say is a much smaller transgression or much lower risk activity? You're watching UTV and joining us tonight on Unpublished TV, David Coletto, the president of Abacus Data, as well as Christine Van Gein, litigation director with the Canadian Constitution Foundation, and Marvin Ryder, assistant professor at the Groot School of Business at McMaster University. We talk about mandatory masks. And uh, David, from your perspective, when does personal liberty trump overall public health? Or does it? Well... Uh... I'm no constitutional or even philosophical expert here. So to answer that question, I think it goes a little beyond what I typically do, but I think if I'm gonna use my expertise in, in understanding where I think the public is, sure. right? Um, I think it's pretty clear that the public as a result of this pandemic is, is overwhelmingly siding on, I will let government probably go farther to enforce some rules that I may not love, but I'm willing to accept more today because of my fear of the, 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 the consequences of this virus getting worse or spreading again. And the more that we see the chaos in the United States and 60, 70, maybe close thousand cases a day, the more Canadians will actually be open, I think, to government stepping in and enforcing and, and putting in more restrictions on them. Um, you know, when we ask a question in our survey, and we've done this you know, multiple times mm -hmm. over the last number of months, do you want governments in Canada to err on the side of caution, go slow in terms of how they reopen society and the, the economy? Or do you want them to, now that you know the spread of the virus is more or less under control, start opening things up quicker? Almost eight out of 10 Canadians side with the go slow, cautious side of it. And to me, that's an indicator that, you know, if you ask Canadians to have to choose right now, I think about 80% would say, mm -hmm. I'm willing to give up some of those freedoms to, to wear a mask or not, if it creates more stability, if it ensures that we get this under control and that the economic and health consequences of this pandemic end sooner rather than later. Fear is quite the motivator. It is. And it's been a, you know, you have to keep in mind too, that in the early days of this pandemic, we were bombarded with messages oh. about how dangerous this virus is. Um, you know, two weeks ago, I went up to uh, Muskoka for a little vacation and I wanted to, my mom who lives in uh, Toronto, just north of Toronto, 
I invited her up. I haven't seen her since February. I was excited to see her. It was, you know, uh, we're in phase two. We could, we could at least get mm -hmm. together. And she was scared uh, of leaving her own home in the city because of, of the fear of this virus. So I think fear is a very powerful motivator. And it, it, it sometimes mutes our instincts for freedom, for liberty, those mm -hmm. other things that we want um, in, in these kinds of periods. Uh, Marvin, you know, let's shift the, the mandatory mask here a little bit because, you know, we're going from personal liberty, but, you know, the reason the mask is out there is to obviously, you know, we get better, we get healthier, and and then we can open up more of the businesses. And uh, as we uh, head into, um, well, it's actually, uh, stage three here in Ontario, um, we, that'll certainly be an issue. Uh Mike, my, my question for you is, you know, we, we've got this Goldman Sachs economist uh, who says a mandatory mask law in the U.S. would would help save lives and the economy. First off, how would it save the economy? Well, what they're saying is uh, if you look at the disease in the United States right now, it looks like they're heading back to another lockdown. Uh, you might remember that we locked down in Canada for most of March, April, mm -hmm. May, and then we started to creak open the doors a little bit. The United States never really got to a full lockdown, and some states like Florida and Texas started to open with the encouragement of the president of the United States, just a, perhaps a little earlier than they should have. And now we're hearing in California, for instance, today mm -hmm. alone, they're going to go back. They're going to go back. And, and is this for two weeks? Is it for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? They didn't get it right. And so to the point that was made a moment ago, I think people watching the United States here in Canada are saying, well, we don't want that. Uh, I'm going to err on the side of caution because I don't want that. Now, this study from Goldman Sachs said if they have to go back to a lockdown, it's going to cost the economy 5%, a 5% shrinkage in the gross domestic product. That's not a shocking number. We saw that in March. Canada's economy shrank 7%. In April, it shrank 11%. The good news is it's starting to grow again as we reopen. But if you have to go back to lockdown, that's going to cost your economy. So you pick your argument. Do you want to do this to help save the health of other people? Or do you want to do this to keep the economy from going back into lockdown? This might be the cost. And one last thing, a little wrinkle on this. Uh, many people going back to those fears, and, and maybe we can get some data on that, are worried about a so-called second wave. That Yes, we wrestled this mm -hmm. to the ground, and then suddenly in October, November, a second wave comes charging back. Would we, as Canada, now that we know this disease, it's no longer novel, we've had several months of experience with it, would we go back into a lockdown or would we do a, a targeted lockdowns? So we might lock down some restaurants, we might lock down some movie theaters, what have you. Would we then make the mandatory masks go further, the social distancing go further? I have a feeling now that we know this beast, we will not go down to a lockdown unless we absolutely, absolutely have to. So Again, this compromise, I don't want to be masked for the rest of my life, but I am prepared to do it for a little while so that I can avoid these bad consequences. One of our uh, Facebook questions uh, suggests, and I'm uh, going to add a little bit on this one, the, uh, now that the, the mask mentality has been introduced to North America, because we've seen it in, in, in China, we've seen it in Japan, we've seen it in Europe, uh, do you think it's something that's going to become even after the pandemic, it's still going to be here. We're going to see, we're going to see more people wearing masks all the time. What do you think, David? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe some people during like a flu season or, you know, they're going to, but this is my personal view and mm -hmm. I, I hate wearing them. Um, oh, and yeah. I don't think I'm going to do it unless I absolutely have to, or feel it's going to protect others or myself. So you know, we might see more people do it after. Or there might be this kind of tail as, as, as people get used to doing it. One of the things I've always been saying over the last how many months, three, four months mm -hmm. of this is people form new habits when you're forced to do it for long periods of time. And I've been working from home and now maybe I'm going to be able to go back to the office next week. Am I going to feel comfortable doing it right away? It's going to feel awkward at first. So I do think there's likely going to be some, some long-term effects of, of this on behavior, but I just... I think the moment we don't have to wear them, most people will, will not wear them. What do you think, uh, Christine? Um, well, I would add that um, we certainly have a lot of businesses now in Ontario and in Canada who are producing masks. 
So I think that they might get into marketing, that this is a important thing that we should all be doing. I actually have a friend who's gotten into the business of producing masks. So uh, there's definitely going to be a big sales pitch on masks mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future as we've invested a lot of money into building this as an industry in Ontario, at least. And, and that's something, uh, you know, and Marvin, that, you know, you, you teach a business class and, you know, it's supply and demand. That's the basic thing. We don't have the supply or we don't have the demand. There you go. Right. Right. Well, I, the question here is, will that demand continue? And I, I'm, I'm not sure either. Uh, Canada clearly is a very diverse country. People come from lots of different backgrounds. When this began in February, before the formal lockdown, I had students in my classes coming with masks on. Now, they were mostly of Asian backgrounds, people who'd come out, as you suggested, Japan, mm. Korea. Uh, for them, it was normal for them to wear masks on tremendously smoggy days or, or when the air quality wasn't that good. So they, they had a supply of masks with them. It wasn't that big of a deal to just put one on. I didn't have a supply of masks. So I've now gone out and bought a package of 20. I've used five. Um, if I've still got some kicking around, we get a bad day next year, maybe forest fires or something. But I think people will want to go back. But the ultimate, if you love a little marketing thing here, do you remember the nice fellow who was behind the the slap chop, and then he came out with something called yep. the Sham Wow. Yeah, the Sham Wow. Now the people from Sham Wow have got their own mask infused with zinc, and it can be yours for. And call now, <laughs> you know anyone who smells a buck, they're going to be out there trying to take advantage of this. Wow, it's hard to believe. And, and you know, let's face it, you know the whole thing uh, about this pandemic is 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 getting the economy rolling again, and you know the. the uh, Interesting study out of the U.S. would show that uh, with 78, the, the, with the institution of mandatory masks in Italy and uh, in New York City over a three-week span, 66,000 lives were saved and 78,000 lives were saved. But uh, that doesn't seem to, to resonate with a lot of people. Well, not Americans specifically. I think they, they, they trade off the need of the many versus the need of the one, perhaps a little differently than we do in Canada. As was said, I think we're willing to give up a little of this voluntarily, but also in the back of our minds, thinking of this as short term, I'm going to do this for two months, three months. I think if this was told to them up front, you're going to have to do this for the next six years, probably there'd be a little more pushback on all this. But for the moment, because we are rebounding, this, this is what they call a V-shaped rebound. Now, the slide down was steeper than the bounce back up. But we are looking very much like a V-shaped recovery. And if we avoid that second wave, then I think people will say, okay, what's my dividend for being a good, good soldier here? Okay, I don't have to wear masks after Thanksgiving, let's say. Great, I'm okay with that. So uh, whether they should feel that way, I think there's plenty of arguments mm -hmm. to say, you're giving up a right a little too quickly here, folks. But that's a kind of a Canadian thing. We really put the needs of the many ahead of the needs of the one. All right. And uh, I've got a, uh, uh, Christine, I've got a question you for, uh, for you from the, uh, from our viewers on Facebook. Does selling masks become a question of ethics? Shouldn't masks be free for the sake of everyone? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can make the same argument about all kinds of things that are necessary for our lives. Um, yeah. And, and no, you're not entitled to the government paying for your masks for you. But I'd like to, I, can, if, I, if you don't sure. mind, I'd just Go like ahead. to address one of the things that you had asked previously, which was how do we weigh um, the legitimate public health benefit yeah. of yeah. all kinds of government policies with our rights to liberty. And there is an answer to that in our charter, which is in section one, which is where you balance off um, rights with, there, it's, the, it's the reasonable limits clause in the charter in section one. And any limits on fundamental rights, like your right to liberty, which is where your right not to have to wear a mask is, or your right to equality, which is where the, the disability related rights are, any of those rights, if you're going to impair them, if the government's going to impair them, those limits need to be rationally connected to an objective. They need to be minimally impairing. So they need to be the least impairing possible. They need to be narr narrowly tailored and they need to be proportionate. So they can't do more harm than good. Uh, so there is a test in our charter. I do think that uh, a lot of the time people are too eager to find justifications under section one. We should always aim to protect our liberties and our rights um, rather than limit them. But there is a test in our charter about how that is done um, if there is a real public policy reason to limit rights. All right, now, uh, David, I, I'm... Uh... 
wondering from your perspective, uh, a second wave. And, and what, what kind of an impact are we going to see if we, if we get a second wave? Well, let's hope we don't. Um, you know, it's, it is, Marvin alluded to earlier, it's probably one of the things Canadians are worried about the most related to the pandemic right now. Um, it's intensifying as we watch what's happening in other parts of the world, particularly down south. Um, if it were to happen in Canada, um, you know, I think it's, 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 I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing it play out in the mm -hmm. United States um, yeah. in large parts. And it's, it's this retreat back to the kind of lockdown that I think most Canadians, almost <laughs> all Canadians re really didn't want to do. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been monitoring in terms of public opinion is this has for almost this entire period been a health crisis. Uh, from the public's perspective, fear of contracting the virus, fear of spreading it to other people. Um, but we are increasingly coming and understanding the economic aspect of this and, and the mental health impact, which is tied to the economic. And I think if we do get a second spike and we are forced to lock down again, you know, I think we've seen the fiscal cost. It, it, it's just going to spiral even more. So I think these kinds of measures, mandatory masks, are... Um, our health authority government's way of doing everything they can to prevent that second spike because i think it is uh from from their perspective mm -hmm. you know not only the lives that could be lost but the economic cost becomes so much more well folks uh, i, I want to thank you all for uh joining us this evening great discussion about mandatory masks uh and uh, uh david colato is the president of abacus data christine van guyden of the canadian constitution foundation and marvin Ryder. he's the assistant professor de Groot school of business at mcmaster university a great discussion on mandatory masks now coming up next week on unpublished tv we're going to talk about opening up the skies and get airlines back in the air i want to thank you for watching unpublished tv i'm ed hand